All right. In numerous democracies across the world, there's a legitimate concern about or even an observation of what is now commonly referred to as democratic erosion or backsliding. Essentially, it's a retrenchment of democratic quality or the general state of democracy. An important phenomenon that contributes to this, particularly as of recent, is political or ideolo ideological polarization. I think it would even be fair to argue that one of the more notable challenges to democracy today, perhaps together with populism, is polarization. If we think of the political landscape in the United States, for example, particularly uh, today, right after the first presidential debate, this is kind of emblematic when we talk about polarization or the creation of some kind of pertinent or structural divide between ideological camps. This kind of structural divide between groups is also something we observe when we talk about populism, right? We consider society to be divided in two rather homogenous groups uh, who almost per definition cannot overlap or find each other. So it's needless to say that these two particular concepts, namely polarization and populism, uh, they are, or at least they can be, closely related to each other. Today, I'm joined by Lisa Zanotti to talk about this relationship between polarization and populism, as well as both of their effects individually on, on democracy. So, Lisa, I already referred to the notion of polarization in a rather very crude manner. Could you perhaps shed some light on what exactly we mean by polarization? Uh, yes, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, well, in general terms, we can say that uh, scholars uh, have referred to polarization as the ideological distance between uh, to, between parties in the system or between individuals in society. Um, as you already um, mentioned it, um, this is known as ideological polarization, meaning that uh, the differences or the distance between parties or individuals in the system uh, is based on their ideology and as a consequence on their um, policy preferences. Um, one important thing I want to mention right now, I'm going to pick it up later uh, when we are we will we will talk about the relationship between polarization and democracy. Um, it that uh, as far as I am concerned, um, polarization is not a dichotomy. Uh, this means that uh, it does not make. Uh, much sense saying that a party system or a society are polarized or not. Um, I conceive polarization as a matter of degrees, meaning that if we think polarization as a continuum, we go from one extreme, which is extremely convergent party system or society, in which parties are very close one to another, uh, to extremely polarized party system when parties, if, you, if we think about the two party system when parties are like one on the extreme left, uh, for example, one on the extreme right, right? And this is really important when, you think, when we think about um, the effect uh, of polarization on democracy, for example. Um, the other thing I wanna, the other thing I wanna um, make uh, clear is that uh, when we think about um, polarization, uh, mainly in party system, it is important to think about polarization beyond the left-right uh, socioeconomic uh, cleavage or, the, or divide. Um, it is true that the left-right um, cleavage is structuring most of party system, at least in, in Western Europe, but there are some party system that are structured alongside different cleavages or divides or um, line of conflict or issues, right? So when we measure polarization, this is extremely important just because if you measure polarization just in the left, right or socioeconomic uh, divide, in some cases we uh, do not grasp the entire like um, amount of polarization in the party system. Let's think about Spain. Spain is a, is a very good example, just because Spain historically has been um, structured the Spanish, the Spanish party system alongside two cleavages, right? The left-right cleavage, the socioeconomic one, and the territorial cleavage. 
Um, so if you measure at the hour of measuring polarization, if you measure polarization as a matter, just a matter of left or right, we cannot grasp the entire amount of polarization in the system just because we are missing out on, on another relevant cleavage. Um, so yeah, um, this, is, uh, this is ideological classic polarization. Um, yeah. So in general, I think polarization, or at least from the literature today, is something that's relatively widespread, right? It's also yeah. particularly relevant uh, in, in uh, political systems. Uh, in your research, you focus on a very particular form uh, of polarization, namely what you call or what is called effective polarization. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about that and what exactly effective polarization is? Uh, yeah, um, effective polarization is a form of polarization uh, which, as you as you mentioned, is very um, spread nowadays. Um, and with effective polarization, scholars refer to um, the extent to what the, to um, the extent of the like or dislike um, some certain parties or um, or um, individual, uh, which. Uh, who holds a different, uh, my who holds opposing political identity. Um, so the difference between ideological and uh, affective polarization is that while ideological polarization is based on policy preferences, uh, affective polarization is based on emotions, right? So um, affective polarization moves uh, beyond issue based differences and uh, relates to social identities. So um, it's, it's a, a sort of emotional reaction I have in like towards or against a certain group, right, or, cert or certain party. And um, if we think about uh, the Trump administration, right, mm -hmm. people are pro-Trump or people are anti-Trump. And if you think about it, it's not much about policies. It's about identity. I mean, if you are a Trump supporter and I'm not, I tend to dislike you because of your identity, not because you support one of Trump's policies. Uh, people, like, people started to like or dislike themselves based on their identity. Like, and a curious, very curious case is uh, Brexit, because if you think about it, Brexit is a policy, it's about a policy, right? It's mm -hmm. like exiting the, the European Union or not, right? So it started as a policy, but now people are divided like Brexiter and anti-Brexiters. And Brexit from a policy became an identity. So the party system and the, the public started to polarize on the issue, to, not on the issues of Brexit, but on the how I feel with respect to Brexit and how the other feels with respect to Brexit, with respect to Brexit right? Um, yeah, so there is um, two different kinds of polarization. One is ideologic, ideological classic, classic polarization, which is issue-based, basically, based on ideology and policy preference, and affective polarization, which is based on emotional reaction to my identity and the perceived identity of the other group. So it's here in particular that we find a close connection to populism. Yes. Right? So can you tell us? how this notion of effective polarization relates or could relate in theory to populism? Yeah. Um, there is, uh, as you mentioned, um, a connection between uh, populism, obviously, and effective polarization. I wouldn't say uh, that there is a causal connection, uh, but there is a, to me, there is a strong association. Um, and you mentioned in the introduction of um, uh, earlier um, the fact that populism, at least in, in its 
ideational um, fashion, right? Um, conceives society as divided into groups that are homogeneous uh, and opposing. Um, and these two groups are morally charged, meaning the people are pure because they hold the, the, the sovereignty, basically, and the elite are bad, are corrupt, not because they are monetary corrupt, but because they are morally corrupt, because they don't do what they are supposed to do in the name of the people, right? So, um, mostly in those cases in which populism is like electorally or politically relevant, um, the populist discourse most of the time entails uh, polarization uh, of the affected type. I mean, um, if I'm part of the group that conceives the, uh, that conceives the other bad because, um, mo morally bad, I mean, uh, it gets to a point in which I started to conceive the other people on the basis of their identity and if this identity is different and is opposing to mine um, societies and party system started to become effectively polarized um, so throughout all of this there's quite an important role for not only the us but the them so the opposition basically so what is the exact role of that the opposition plays in, in this regard for uh, effective polarization? Yeah, I mean, if we think about um, the discourse of uh, populist leaders, I mean, we already said that the discourse of populist leaders are highly divisive, right? So they create an out group. Um, so the level of effective polarization when populists are in power or I mean, when they are electorally relevant, is is uh, is, is gonna is gonna be on the rise, right? Um, at this point, it is important the discourse of the, the others, the the out group, right? Just because if the others uh, start to like perform a discourse which is similar, uh, mirroring. The, the the one of populists it's gonna be uh populist polar um, affective polarization uh have uh more chances to heighten just because um it, it is a little bit uh, of uh the contrary of what uh, michelle obama said i mean when they go low we go high mm -hmm. if uh when they go low we go lower uh it's gonna be a really really uh big problem for i mean for the stability of the party system for the cohesion of society and for democracy also so if if we think that there is an actual connection between effective polarization and populism yeah. we can perhaps ask or we should perhaps ask the important question chicken or the egg question yeah. right so you said that there is no necessary connection between the two uh, but what's the causal story here is it populism that tends to lead to polarization or is it polarization that tends to lead to populism do the two just in general just appear jointly or what do you think is the the causal story here i tend to believe that uh populism is i mean it's most prob probable that populism leads to polarization or maybe I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the causal link uh, but I think that the divisive discourse of populists um, even more when, when, when they are relevant and when media start to pick it up um, leads to uh, an increasing level of affective polarization both in the party system but also in society just because i i tend to believe that uh affective polarization is a elite driven phenomenon mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think the role of the parties and the discourse of the leaders, it's, it's, it's very important. Um, with respect to this, I think we have a video. Can you? Yeah, the first one? Uh, yes. Okay, so let me share the screen. Understanding division American politics. Effective polarization is the degree to which Democrats and Republicans in the United States um, like or dislike one another. It's measured by the degree to which Democrats and Republicans are willing to marry one another, whether they would be happy or, or unhappy if their child married someone from the other side, whether or not they're willing to discriminate against the other side or avoid them. In the 1960s, roughly 5% of Americans said they would be unhappy if their child married someone from the other party. Today, the number stands at over 30%. So there's been a five-fold increase in the number of people that would be unhappy if this happened. We know that when people think of themselves as Democrats or Republicans, what they're really thinking about is their social group. The same way as some people might think about their race or their religion or their gender, it's what they identify with. A long line of social psychology literature says when you do this, you start not thinking about issues, but thinking about feelings, about how I feel towards Democrats if I'm a Republican or vice versa if I'm a Democrat. At the same time that effective polarization was on the rise, you also saw a dramatic change in the media environment and more opportunities for people to seal themselves off from here on the other side. One perspective is that the new information environment, the internet, cable TV, outrage radio, has been fueling effective polarization. Another potential route of polarization uh, and one that I am now exploring in a working paper is whether the rise of closed selections have exacerbated the problem. Um, what we've seen is an increase in very close elections across the U.S., elections that are won by uh, one percentage point or two, a coin flip election. When elections are very close, competitors feel like they have more to win or lose, um, so they fight the campaign harder campaigns become more toxic, um, there's more spending, there's more candidate attack ads. They're not attacking candidates on the issues, they're attacking candidates on their character. All this leads to a more toxic information environment, as we call it, uh, which could exacerbate polarization. So what we find is that people who live in districts that became more competitive because of redistricting have become more effectively polarized. My own belief is that effective polarization is elite-driven, that it's caused by politicians and people following politicians. Politicians are the leaders of their group. So when politicians use less vitriolic language, people will stop doing so as well. Um, so in my mind, the solution is uh, different leadership. Okay, so that tells us quite a bit about the the relationship between uh, those those two. And so, can can we then kind of recap or summarize the connection between effective uh, polarization and populism as two phenomena that are not necessarily or not automatically connected, but are still highly intertwined? Yes, I think that. As I told you, when populism is relevant electorally or politically, like like um, what happened for Brexit, um, this came associated with high level of effective polarization. Which, if you if if we think about it, I mean, populism is associated with effective polarization and not necessarily with ideological polarization, just because it is true that. I mean, populist parties may entail an, a rise of ideological polarization, but it's not due to populism. It's due to like the host ideology. I mean, we know that populist parties, are, like most of populist parties, are radical in their ideology. So it's 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 this ideology that may like uh, entail um, 
the um, ideological polarization. Uh, but it is different. I think it is populism that is strongly associated with affective polarization, not that much to ideological polarization. I mean, with, the, with ideological polarization, it can be, but with affective polarization, it definitely is. Um, so if we try to put things in perspective and kind of broaden the scope uh, to kind of wrap wrap this up, I want to briefly touch upon the effects actually, or the relation to democracy or the effect that yeah. um, this has on democracy. How does effective polarization uh, affect democracy? And, and is this something that we need to be mindful of? Or is it something that we should even should be afraid of? Um, I guess so. <laughs> Just because um, affective polarization in the end can, like, taken to its extremes, can erode citizens' willingness to engage with opposing political views. Because let's think about it. I mean, if I think that you're bad, morally bad, right, because you have an identity that is different from mine, uh, your political views are not legitimate to me. So why should I engage uh, with you, right? So this may lead also, may lead also to the difficult um, to accept others' democratic claims because of the same reason. I mean, if you're bad, uh, your claims are not democratic to me. Right. And ultimately, um, high levels of affective polarization uh, may uh, heighten the cost of accept defeat in elections. Um, and this is for the same reason, just because if you're not a legitimate opponent, right, why should I? Uh, uh, accept that you defeated me in an election, right? So, and this is uh, by the book, what's happening in the US right now, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Trump is starting to like, uh, saying that uh, if he's gonna, if he's gonna lose, it's because election are rigged, right? Um, so it is like, I think the US right now is the country in which this is like more evident, the high levels of ideological polarization. We're not even talking about issues. They're talking about identities. And the identities are, this particular identity is embodied by one person, which is like, it's, it's not a US um, thing. I mean, this happens way, a match in Latin American countries, for example, uh, if we think about Chavism in Venezuela. Um, Hugo Chavez uh, was able to structure the party system uh, between those who were in favor of him, the Chavistas, and the one who opposed him, anti-Chavistas. And the party system, after the collapse, it re-emerged as divided by one person, one leader, right? And this is affective polarization at its best. I mean, I like you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I like you because you're on my side. Mm -hmm. So we might be different, but the one thing that it's we have in common, our identity, um, it's it's the thing that opposes us to the other, the outgroup. So you see, I mean, it has a lot in common with populism. So yeah, that just goes to show that you know, politics based or driven by emotions is not always necessarily a good thing and we should never uh, neglect policies or issues which should still be at the foundation of politics. Lisa, thank you very much for uh, being a part of this. Thank you for having me. Thank you.